Tall. And I'm Small. And today we are doing Khan Academy's MCAT Prep Biomolecules Chromosomal Inheritance Questions. Okay, the very first question. What of the following provides the best evidence that DNA is the genetic material? Is it biomolecular composition of chromosomes, mechanism of semi-conservative DNA replication, transformation using heat activated bacteria heat inactivated bacteria or the presence of dna in all cells <laughs> is it i'm confused what provides the best evidence that dna is the genetic material yeah so so this reminds me of like the first couple weeks in micro uh and we talk about all those different um uh, experiments is the word I was looking for mm. that people did to determine whether or not it was protein or DNA that was really because they they knew that chromosomes were made up of protein and DNA but they really wanted to see which one was the genetic material right um, and uh, obviously we know that it ended up being DNA but they did that through transformations oh I guess I wasn't even really reading this correctly Oh, so transformation using heat inactivated bacteria. So what exactly did they learn from that? Um, I, I think it was the ability of cells to uptake that just DNA and regain that activity. Uh, I, and I don't remember uh, exactly what the activity was. Sure, but, but they that could makes take sense. up foreign DNA, incorporate it into their own chromosome, and then make that change. So if you give this organism just dna it's going to affect a change in there that we know only the genetic material is going to affect exactly and when they did a similar experiment with protein it didn't do anything okay okay cool all right next question a gene which is called tall Ugh. has recently been discovered that helps control the height that people will reach and results in taller than average height which of the following statements about this gene's heritability are true Okay, so uh, real quick, um, they don't say anything about it being dominant, recessive, autosomal, or sex-linked. Right. Okay, possible answer choices. If tall has 25% penetrance, then it must be autosomal recessive. If tall has 50% penetrance, then only half the population has the tall gene. If tall has variable expressivity, everyone with the tall gene will be tall. Or if tall has constant expressivity, Every cell in the body will express the tall protein. I think there's only one that makes any sense here. Okay, so if tall is 25% penetrance, it must be autosomal recessive. So, so penetrance, that word I think is is literally talking about uh, the population. Yeah, it's it's presence in the population, whether yeah. it be carried or you know expressed, whatever. Yeah. Um. So in this case, 25% uh, penetrance, I don't know of a Punnett square for one gene that would give you only 25% penetrance. Yeah. Um, so I think that one's out. If tall has 50% penetrance, then only half the population has the tall gene. Only half the population has the tall gene. Well, hold on a second. Didn't they say that they just discovered this gene? Which means that everyone has the gene. Or is this an allele of the gene? Um, then there's, if tall has variable expressivity, everyone with the tall gene will be tall. That doesn't sound right. That Yeah, it definitely doesn't sound right. Sounds like um, some people with the gene might be, some people won't be. It depends on other factors. Yep. And then the last one, so we can rule out the first one and the third one. Uh, the last one, if tall has constant expressivity, every cell in the body will express the tall protein. And I think extra expressivity and penetrance are talking about the population not cells in the body so right okay so the one that makes sense to me well it doesn't totally make sense but by process of elimination if tall has 50 percent penetrance then only half the population has the tall gene oh no and it's incorrect oh no well what is the correct answer come on sal give me something okay if tall has variable expressivity, everyone with the tall gene will be tall. Let's look at these hints. Oh, no. What? Okay. Penetrance measures the fraction of people with the genotype who express the corresponding phenotype. Uh. So penetrance is a measure of phenotype. Expressivity measures the range of expression of a certain genotype. Constant expressivity means that the genotype is expressed exactly the same way each time. 
Protein expression is controlled on a cell-to-cell -cell basis, i.e. eye color genes are not expressed in the liver. And then the, t the, the concept of expressivity depends on the gene having 100% penetrance. So if the tall gene has variable expressivity, then everyone with the tall gene is of above average height. Okay, so variable expressivity, meaning that it doesn't, that kind of goes against the idea <coughs> of constant expressivity. Huh, the concept of expressivity depends on the gene having 100% penetrance. So if the tall, if tall has variable expressivity, then everyone with the tall gene is of above average height. Hmm, all right, Our I can- genetics is rusty. Yeah, I can hang with that for now, but we're definitely gonna go back to that. Okay, next question. The results of a linkage analysis of genes A, B, C, and D have just come in from the lab. In what order are the alleles found on the chromosome? And then they give us a, uh, a table here showing gene combinations and then recombination frequencies. So we have AB is 3%, AC is 5%, BC is 8%, AD is 8%, and CD is 3%. Okay, so this is a, uh, a common thing that they're gonna show you on the MCAT. And what you need to do to answer a question like this is basically draw a line. And that line is going to be your chromosome. And on your chromosome, you're gonna have your genes A, B, C, and D. You don't know necessarily what order they're in, um, but that's why you have the recombination frequencies. So you know that if you have something like A and B, uh, and then they recombine at 3% frequency, that's not a lot. But if you have something like BC or AD, which are both at 8%, that is a lot. So what we can see here is that AB, um, we can try to put at, at the beginning, right next to each other. They recombine 3% of the time. Um, then let's look at something else. We have A to C, so that's 5%. I'm going to say that, uh, that C is then after AB. Uh, then we see BC is 8%. So that's further than AC. Therefore, B should probably actually be going first at this point. So now we have BAC. AD is 8%, which if we have BAC, the distance between B and C is 8%. If we just shift that over to start at A, then you could just put D on the other side of C, and that could be 8%. And then at that point, if we're doing everything kind of equally in this, uh, this mathematics of 3, 8, and 5, adding up and subtracting and whatnot, then C and D, it would make sense, would be 3% apart. Or sorry, not 3% apart, 3% recombination frequency, meaning they're closer together. So the answer uh, order-wise should be B, A, C, D. Um, and do we see that? We do see that here. It's in uh, the backwards order of how I described it, but we do see D, C, A, B. So I'm very impressed with Tall right now because he could talk his way through all of that, and <laughs> I had to draw it out. <laughs> <laughs> but we both came to the same conclusion, and it was correct. All right, moving on to the next question. A researcher was doing test crosses on mice, but forgot which mice he had bred together. When the litter was born, Every mouse had black eyes, and half had brown fur. What was the genotype of the parent mice? And then they give us that uh, capital R is red fur, lowercase r is brown fur. Capital B is black eyes, lowercase is brown eyes. Okay, so they all had black eyes, which means that it could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Um, but it does say that half of them had brown fur. Mm -hmm. So that means half of them had to be, uh, okay, so half of them had to be homozygous recessive for that allele to, to have brown fur, meaning the other half were heterozygous to have red fur. So for that specific gene, one of the parents had to be uh, heterozygous, the other one had to be homozygous recessive for the fur gene. So we would expect to see one of our answers be heterozygous R's and homozygous recessive R's, and boom, there's only one answer that fits that. Yep. Well done. Awesome, and it worked. Okay, next question. A set of homologous chromosomes undergoes genetic recombination to create the following results. And uh, they show some really poorly drawn 
uh, chromosomes that recombine. Um, which of the following is the most likely recombination or event? Is it a two-strand single crossover, a three-strand double crossover, a two-strand triple crossover, or a three-strand single crossover? Okay, so um, when, we, when we look at these, we see that there's a blue and a green chromosome. Uh, the blue one, one of the strands, is, uh, after we do the cross, one of the strands at the bottom is green. And then on the green one, we see one of the strands has a little blue chunk, and then another strand has a little blue chunk. So without really knowing anything about this, I see three strands. Yeah, I do, that are involved in that crossing over. So um, I would say I'm going to rule out the two strand ones and say this has to be a three strand. Uh, and then the fact that it's on two different strands, well, no, but that would make three strands. Of the sister chromatids. So why would you think a double crossover rather than a single crossover? So um, what I'm thinking is um, that at each level of that, you know, that mitosis, mm -hmm. right, um, actually, I, meiosis. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm really bad at mitosis, so, meiosis. So meiosis 1, right, is when we pulled yes. across the homologous chromosomes. And so that might be where the first one happened. Mm. And then uh, meiosis 2, which is a mirror image of mitosis, we would be pulling apart sister chromatids. Oh. And perhaps there would be another. Well, actually, doesn't it just happen in prophase 1 of meiosis? That's what I thought, but what you said was making a lot of sense. Ah, uh, so... <laughs> I'm, there are three strands involved, uh, and I don't know how else it would have gotten to the other side, so I'm going to go three-strand double crossover. I like it. Okay. Hey, it was right. Okay. Uh, shall we look at the hints? Yeah. <laughs> okay, a single double or triple crossover refers to the number of crossover events. Only two strands are involved in a crossover at a time. Yes. As we can see in, f in the figure, at least three strands are involved in this crossover. Okay, we got that, right? Meaning that the most likely uh, that, that most likely a three strand double crossover, huh? They don't explain double. Oh no no they do. A single double or triple crossover refers to the number of crossover events. Yeah. So how did we know that two crossover events happened? Just by looking at this picture. Because only one happens at a time, and there were three strands involved. So the first two strands were the first event, and the second that second one and the third strand. Or the second event. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Very cool. All right, next question. Which of the following statements about synaptonemal complexes is not true? Well, that would help if I knew what synaptonemal complexes exactly. meant. Exactly. Okay, but let's look at the answers. Maybe we can MCAT our way through this. They form between sister chromatids. They act as a support structure. They are made up of functional RNA and protein. Or they form during synapsis. Okay, so synaptonemal complexes, not true. They form during synapsis. I would just guess, based on word association, that that would be true. Mm -hmm. um, they're made up of functional RNA and protein. I wouldn't rule that out right off the bat. This is literally us just, like, intuitive our way through this. Yeah. They act as a support structure. Well, if they have to do a synapsis, then I could see that happening okay do you know what synapsis is no oh okay oh yeah oh i'm i'm intuiting my way through this way more than you are apparently oh no no i have no idea what it is oh okay no we're on the same playing ground then <laughs> oh god bless you Thank aren't you. her sneezes adorable <laughs> okay they form between sister chromatids i'm thinking that's isn't that where centromeres go i should know that <laughs> i think that's where centromeres go I'm going to say it's that, that that is not true, that they form between sister chromatids. Oops. Oh, and that answer was incorrect. They act as a support structure? Nope. They're made of functional RNA and protein? That is it. Okay, so let's learn about synaptonemal complexes. Synaptonemal complexes are often described as the scaffold upon which recombination takes place. Synaptonemal complexes form between the, the two structures that will undergo genetic recombination, homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids. Um, like most functional components of the cell, synaptonemal complexes are made up of highly specialized proteins, but no RNA is involved. 
Okay, so that's an easy enough uh, explanation for the answer. So because they're a protein scaffold, they're not involved in the chemistry, which is why we might not have ever heard of them in a bio class before. Oh. So they, uh, the protein in that scenario acts just like the protein of a ribosome in that um, all of the chemistry is happening between the nucleic acid and the protein is just acting like a scaffold. Okay. Okay, so it's made of highly specialized proteins, no RNA, hence that answer. Okay, next question. A colorblind man marries a woman with no family history of colorblindness. What is the likelihood that they have a colorblind daughter? Okay, so colorblindness is uh, sex-linked. Therefore, if they say that the woman has no family history of colorblindness, you can expect her to be odd, uh, to be um, homozygous dominant. Okay. So, so not a carrier, basically. Um, and is it, so you said it's sex-linked, is it X-linked recessive? It, yes, X-linked okay. recessive. Um, so if we, if they, if there's a, a man who is colorblind, he only has one X chromosome, he has to have uh, that allele on that chromosome. Therefore, uh, there's actually zero chance that they can have a colorblind daughter. Yeah, because, oh no, wait. Right, so if the mother had no family history of colorblindness, then that would mean that both of her X chromosomes uh, are putatively without the colorblind gene. Um, and if you have a colorblind man, then that guarantees that that X chromosome is going to have the colorblind gene on it. So it should be a 0% chance that the daughter would have colorblind because the daughter would get always one normal X chromosome from mom. And you said it's X-linked recessive. Yes, X-linked recessive. It's important to remember. All right, yeah, we got it right. Awesome. Next question. Uh, ooh, Hardy Weinberg. Mm -hmm. Which of the following populations folk, uh, <laughs> coat for feather color uh, gene is most likely to be in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? Okay, is it, so we're talking about the, like the, the fur color, the feather color. Is it lab rats being bred by scientists? a flock of moths that must blend in with their environment to survive, a flock of seagulls that feeds on one type of fish, or a pack of wolves in a zoo. Okay, uh, it has been a long time since Hardy Weinberg. Um, yeah, that's like bio one. Yeah, I feel like if there's a, if there's a human, like in, if there's an artificial environment, it can't be Hardy Weinberg. Yeah. That, that feels right to me. So lab rats probably being right out. Yeah, I would also say wolves in a zoo. Out. Yeah, so this is the thing. I can never remember whether this equilibrium is supposed to be, you know, the population is not evolving or it is evolving. Right. Um, so we need to do a process of elimination here, or I would have needed to. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so if we, if we throw up both of those... Um, we have a flock of moths that must blend into their environment to survive, or a flock of seagulls that feeds on one type of fish. So blending with your environment sounds pretty good right off the bat, but yeah. I really don't remember. I know for Hardy Weinberg, they tend to they tend to say like like the Amish, I think, are in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium because okay. there's so little um, immigration, immigration. Yeah, yeah. There's little genetic variation really going on there. Okay, so maybe not evolving is what this equilibrium is. It might be. Okay, so blending in directly is evolving. And and one of those principles for it was like uh, the relative rates of immigration and immigration are equal or something like that. Okay. So the numbers aren't changing and like I think mating has to be random, which is a funny way of saying it. Right, when right. When we're talking about humans. But um, so that rules out like the lab rats and the wolves because I bet we would be mating the healthiest. Yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and new ones would be introduced possibly at any, any point. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so then a flock of moths that must blend in with their environment to survive. That sounds like, like they are evolving. They're getting selected for based on some kind of pressure. Yeah. Uh, a flock of seagulls that feeds on one type of fish seems like, well, there's kind of a pressure that they only feed on one type of fish. Yeah. Um, but it feels more right, so I'm going to try it and hit check. Okay, it's right, but I do not know why. Yeah. <laughs> so let's look at the hints. Okay, for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, mating must be random. 
Okay, so I, I guess that is that definitely throws out lab rats being bred by scientists. Um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is only achieved if natural selection is not occurring. Natural selection not occurring. So a pack of wolves in a zoo. Natural selection would not be occurring. Um, ooh, uh, if not, so it only it's only achieved if natural selection is not occurring. So a pack of wolves in a zoo could be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, but a flock of moths blending into their environment would not be. Um, okay, a flock of seagulls that eats only uh, that eats only type of fish. We're pointing out so many errors here in Khan Academy. Uh, we have a stuff. lot of material. We can give them some, cut them some slack. Okay, um, so I will just throw in the correction there. A flock of seagulls that eats only one type of fish may be under selection for traits related to catching that type of fish, but that would likely not have an effect on the seagull's oh, coat, coat color, color gene. Yeah, we kind of brushed right over that. We didn't we didn't really focus on that when we were reading the question, so that's probably something that was important as well. Huh, so if there's not some kind of natural selection happening to the gene, it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's, that's an easy enough concept to understand and then probably apply to future questions. Okay, next question. Sickle cell anemia is an autosomal recessive, important to note, autosomal recessive genetic disorder whose carriers have a genetic disadvantage in surviving malaria. Hmm, whose carriers have a gen- oh, sorry, a genetic advantage. I read it in my head and thought, I thought they had an advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay, if 42% of the population is malaria resistant, but not anemic, what is the frequency of the sickle cell allele? Ooh, there's a Khan Academy little buzz. Um, Okay, so we have 42% of the population that is malaria resistant, but not anemic. So we would have to assume that um, if this is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder, that that means that 42% of the population, um, which once again, that's about half, um, would be heterozygous uh, for the gene. Meaning right. they, they carry that sickle cell allele, but they're not homozygous recessive. So, what is the frequency of the sickle cell allele? So, it would be in 50% of the population, or sorry, 42% technically here, uh, for the malaria-resistant ones, but then wouldn't it also be in a small percentage of people who are uh, homozygous recessive? Yeah. That's what I would they think. Would have to... But, it's a little weird that they only give us 49%. Oh, well, okay, so 42% of the population, the uh, the sickle cell allele is only half, right? Right. Because it would be one of the two alleles. Yeah. So you could say that... 21. A, yeah, 21, and then maybe add a little bit, because you do ha still have those homozygous recessive people. So 30? Mm. So the answer choices are 30%, 9%, 21%, and 49%. So they, are they asking us in the total population what is the frequency? Uh, yes. Oh, maybe they're not. If 42% of the population is malaria resistant but not anemic, what is the frequency of the sickle cell allele? Yeah, I don't know. Ooh. They need to be more specific, I think. I think they do, because we don't know if they're talking about... Uh, the frequency of the well, they do say forty-two percent of the population. Yeah. What is the frequency of the sickle cell allele? I'm gonna go. My gut is telling me that they're talking about in the entire population. Okay. So we would say you know you would have forty-two, and then add a little bit for the homozygous recessive people, which I think would get us to around thirty percent. I, I hope. don't know. I'm thinking about the pilot score in my head. I think twenty-five percent. Would be homozygous dominant, twenty five percent the other way, mm -hmm. homozygous recessive, and then fifty percent, which is what we are given with the heterozygous, and so, but all of that twenty five percent would be added to the twenty one percent. So, mm. so I just don't know. Well, in a Punnett square, also, wouldn't this end up being, um, wouldn't it end up being fifty fifty, if you cross two people who were heterozygous? Technically, the allele would spread out 50-50. The phenotype wouldn't. Right. But the allele would be 50% of all the alleles. Hmm. I am going to pick 30 and hit check. One, two, three. 
Okay, it was correct. So let's look uh, and see if our math was right. Oh, there's an equation for this, and I always forget it. Okay, so if the two allylic frequencies are P and Q, then P plus Q equals 1. That makes sense? And P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. That, I remember, that's something... I can't remember what they call that. Um, the population that is malaria-resistant but not sick is rep uh, represented by 2PQ, meaning uh, it's 2 times... Oh, okay, this is like the, the P squared would be the um, homozygous dominant people, the two times PQ are the two different heterozygous that you yeah. would see, and then the, uh, the Q squared is that Q allele, which would be the recessive allele, you know, squared times two. Um, in, a, in a Punnett square cross of two heterozygous individuals. Okay, so if 2PQ equals 0.42, like they gave us, then PQ equals... 21, 0.21. Why does PQ equal... Oh, because you divided by 2. Gotcha. Um, so we got that far. Uh, since P plus Q equals 1, then P and Q must be 0.3 and 0.7. Why must P and Q... Because they're multiplied together here, so they end up being like 3 times 7, 21. Oh, 0.3 times 0.7 is yeah. 0.21. Oh, so you take those out, and P plus Q then equals 1, 0.3 plus 0.7. Wow! Yeah, I just don't know, like, how we would designate which one is the 0.7, which one is the 0.3. They seem to have done it really easily. Am I missing something? No, um, I don't think that... It might, it might just be that you know that... There's, uh, well... It's like it's like less frequent to have the disease. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what I would assume. Okay. But I can live with that. All right, last question. Many people have DNA mutations that go unnoticed. What type of mutation is most likely to have no effect on phenotype? So no effect on phenotype. A missense mutation, chromosomal mutation, a deletion, or frame shift mutation? Hmm... Okay, so frame shift, uh, it's probably definitely going to have uh, a, a, an effect. Um, a deletion? Is a frame shift. Right, yeah. Uh, that would cause a frame shift. A chromosomal mutation? I would have to imagine. Oh, if they're talking about like... like what else could there be? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then missense. I don't... Do you, do you exactly remember the definition of missense mutation? Yeah, so missense would be something that changes the amino acid that it was originally, like um, so the wobble position, the, the third part of the codon, mm. you can normally change that and, and maintain the amino acid, but if maybe you change the first or the second position of that codon, and you change uh, like uh, a serine to something that was almost similar, like a threonine or something mm -hmm. like that, then maybe there would be a missense that was benign enough to not be a huge deal. Okay, but... Yeah, yeah. So that that's well. You're right. So the, what they're asking is what's most likely to have, what's most likely to have no effect. So a missense mutation could have an effect. Yeah. But it's the most likely one of all of these to not have an effect. Yeah. I mean, if you were going from like a glycine to tryptophan, I would be concerned. Yes. <laughs> well, but once again, also just depending on what part of the protein. Right. Yeah. It would be inserted into. All right. Let's check it. Hey, that was right. All right. It was missense mutation. We did pretty good. Strong work, gang.